All right, so um, what do you notice that's similar to the Confucian ritual? The one that we looked at last week. Pardon? The one they have figured. Okay, yeah, there is a leader involved here, right? Um, what's different about his role, though? He's not just standing and speaking. He's, he's actually doing stuff. He's not just standing and speaking. He's much more active, right? Yeah, he's walking around. He's kneeling at the altar. He's praying. He's lighting things. He's offering objects, right? Is he interacting with any of the other people around him? No. It seems like he's more like the center of attention kind of person. Yeah, yeah. There are other people doing stuff, right? There are other participants in the ritual, right? But they don't seem to have necessarily all that much to do with each other, right? The musicians and the celebrant could conceivably be on different planets here, right? He doesn't take note of them. Now, to give you some context for this, um, the actual purpose of this ritual is actually kind of similar. Um, this is uh, taking place during what's called Ghost Month. And Ghost Month is the seventh month in the Chinese calendar, which is a lunar calendar, right? So it's you know, going based on cycles of the moon rather than a uh, solar calendar like ours, just cycles of the sun. Yeah? So, like, from what he's doing, I actually did this when I was younger. Uh huh. Doing, but I'm not sure if it's the same thing as what he's doing, but it looks like he was paying respects to his ancestors. Cause it looks like he was holding something with a stick, and that's what I had to do, and just do like that what he did. Exactly, yeah, that, that, that is exactly what he's doing. Um, during Ghost Month, um, <clears throat> the spirits of the dead are supposed to visit the earth. They visit their living relatives. Uh, gifts and plates of food are often laid out for them. Um, what he's doing, he's lighting um, incense that is supposed to be pleasing to them and offering to them objects, right? now. The Confucian ceremony that you watched, um, that was an offering to specific ancestor spirits. Right? That was an offering to the disciples of Confucius, so to important figures who are supposed to be important for everybody. Um, ghost month ceremonies, ghost month offerings tend to be uh, a bit more on the humble side. Right? Offerings to the spirits of ordinary people. Um, anything else you notice here that's different? Yeah, Kathy. It's not structured at all. It doesn't seem as structured as the other one we watched. Because, like, uh -huh. I was seeing a lot of people moving around, like, but then, like, the first video we watched, they were, like, very instinct, but this one's not so much. Yeah, there are people just walking through the temple, right? Just walking right past the ceremony, walking right through the ceremony at a couple of times, right? One of the musicians is sitting there smoking a cigarette. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, this is much more informal, right? If we, how are the people uh, participating in this dressed? <laughs> yeah, they're they're mostly just dressed in street clothes, right? Um, you know, we see even the the priest, right? He's got the robes on, um, and he's got the cat, you know, the the cap. But underneath those robes, you can see he's wearing a pair of black slacks and sneakers, right? So yeah, this is much less formal and much less structured, right? Even the music is much less structured. The two guys with the clarinets, right? They're, they're both playing the same part, but they're not really playing it together, right? It's not like terribly rehearsed. And one of the reasons I wanted you to see this sort of as a basis for comparison um, is that it points to the origins of Taoism in Chinese folk religion and folk practice, right? So Confucianism originates primarily in the practices of social elites, right? And it's largely a response to um, those uh, individuals called Xi. Does everybody remember what this meant? A-S-H-I-H, -H, Xi? Men of service. Men of service, right? These kind of mercenary consultants, right? going around offering their services to various lords. And does anybody remember what Confucius places in opposition to the to the Shi, what he calls the person who is better than the Shi? 
Yeah, the Jun Si, right? The man of service versus the gentleman, the Jun Si. And how does one get to be a Jun Si, generally speaking? Okay, you accumulate day, right? And how does Confucius think you accumulate day? Moral good acts and virtues. Yeah, through at virtuous behavior, right? Humanity. Right, cultivating your humanity. Righteousness. Righteousness. through learning and study, right? Also, yes, through ritual practice, right? So that's how you accumulate day in Confucianism. Now, <clears throat> remember that Confucius is writing in a slightly earlier period in Chinese history, when society is not quite degenerating into anarchy yet, but is just starting to fall apart, right? The Zhao dynasty is fraying at the edges. And so he's coming up with something to try to hold that together. Now, by the time the, the earliest copies of the Tao Te Ching appear, the oldest we have dates from about 300 BCE but it's not in the same order as contemporary copies. Um, by the time the Tao Te Ching comes into being, society has already fallen apart, right? This warring states period is a period of chaos, right? There's no power at the center anymore. The various Chinese states that are big enough and powerful enough have gone to war with each other. There's no longer a unified, there's no longer a unified state, right? So there are a couple of responses that philosophers come up to, or come up with for this, right? One is uh, one that you guys talked about a little bit, right? The uh, the response of the Moists or the legalists. And what the Moists believed was that the state needed to be stronger. The problem with the Zhao dynasty was that the central state was too weak and that it tolerated people coming up with their own private definitions of what was good and what was evil, right? So what the Moists believed should happen, right, they needed it to be a strong legal code that defined good and evil for everyone. That good should mean one thing for everybody, evil should mean one thing for everybody, and that the good should be rewarded, and the evil should be punished, and then you would no longer have anarchy, right? This would put everything back into order. Now the Taoist response to this, and Taoism, or the Tao Te Ching at least, is more directly a response to legalism than it is to anything else, is that society is way too complicated to be simplified in this way. You can't possibly say that there is one kind of good for everyone and one kind of evil for everyone. Right? You simply can't sort of force everybody down the same path. So what a ruler ought to do, what a ruler ought to strive for, is a principle called Wu Wei, which translates to non-action. You accomplish more says a Taoist, by not acting 
than you do by acting. <coughs> What the Taoist values is latent or potential power, right? If you are constantly acting, if you are stepping in and meddling every time something happens in your kingdom or in your domain, then you're wasting energy, right? You're wasting strength. If you hold back, and act only when it is absolutely necessary, then your actions will, have, will, will be more decisive, right? Your actions will mean more. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that you guys probably noticed when you read, when you read this, or there's a lot of talk about empty vessels in the Tao Te Ching, right? So let, let's look at an, uh, an example here. Um, If we look on page 1347, um, chapter 4, can I get a volunteer to read this, starting with The Way is Empty? The way is empty, yet use will not drain it. Thank you, Corbin. Deep it is like the ancestor of the myriad creatures. Blunt the sharpness, untangle the knots, soften the glare. Let your wheels move only along ruts. Darkly visible, it only seems as if it were there. I know not whose son it is. It images the forefather of God. Heaven and earth are ruthless. Oops, okay, keep no, going. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and treat the myriad creatures as straw dogs. The sage is ruthless and, the, and treats the people as straw dogs. Is not the space between heaven and earth like a bellows? It is empty without being exhausted. The more it works, the more it comes out. Much speech leads inevitably to silence. Better to hold fast to the void. All right, keep going. The spirit of the valley never dies. This is called the mysterious female. The gateway of the mysterious female is called the root of heaven and earth. Dimly visible, it seems as if it were there, yet you will not train it. All right, and one more. Um, I would like somebody to read um, chapter 11 on um, page 1348, please. Yeah, Seth, go for it. Uh, from 30 spokes? Yep, from 30 spokes, yep. 30 spokes share one hub. Adapt the nothing therein to the purpose in hand, and you will have the use of the cart. Knead clay in order to make a vessel. Adapt the nothing therein to the purpose in hand, and you will have the use of the vessel. Cut out doors and windows in order to make a room. Adapt the nothing therein to the purpose in hand, and you will have the use of the room. Thus, what we gain is something, yet it is by virtue of nothing that this can be put to use. Okay, great. Thank you, Seth. So let's work backwards from verse 11 here, right? So how do you, how do you make a room that you can use, right? What, do you, what does a room that you can use require? Door. Okay. Yeah, there has to be a way in and out, right? But if this room was filled with concrete, right? Could we sit in here and use this for lectures and discussions? Now, in order to have the use of the room, right, the space has to be empty. In order to use a jug, right, in order to use a jar, right, can you put things in a jar if it's already full? No, it has to be empty in order for you to use it. Right, when you're making a wheel, right, the first part of this here, if you, know, if you make the wheel completely solid, it's going to break, right? You have, you know, you have to have, you know, make spokes, right? You have to make use of that empty space between the spokes. That's what helps keep the wheel together. Now, if we go back to chapter 6 here, right? There's the example of the spirit of the valley. And he keeps talking about the mysterious female, right? Now, what he's talking about, when he talks about the mysterious female, he's talking about a womb, right? Which is a place of potential life, right? It's a place where life is formed, right? Where you take empty space and you fill it with new life. When he talks about the bellows, right? Do you guys know what a bellows is? You probably don't see a lot of these anymore, right? You know, have you ever seen like 
in a movie or a cartoon where somebody's like, well, you got a blacksmith working a forge and they're pumping this great big thing. There's kind of like a needle at the end of it and it works like this. Is it the one that air comes out? And exactly, fire? yeah, yeah. In order to refill the bellows, right, and keep pumping air out of it, you have to keep emptying it, right? You empty it, you fill it back up, you empty it, you fill it back up. Are you guys starting to see the point here yet? Right? Emptiness is potential. Nothingness is potential. Empty space is something that can be filled with spiritual power. And if you act, if you keep pumping that bellows, right, rather than just slowly drawing air in, then you waste your energy, you expend your energy. Um, you know, this is, you know, when he talks in uh, chapter four about, uh, you know, how you should let your wheels move only along old ruts, right? If you go along old established paths rather than forging new ones, the wheels move a lot more easily, right? If you insist on forging a new path, you're going to use a lot more energy than you will if you just stick to the established path, if you just go the way the wheels have always gone. Yeah, Kathy. Okay, so as I was reading and researching about the Dao De Jing, and uh -huh. I asked my friend this question too, I know that the Dao De Jing is like telling you how to live the way mm -hmm. and everything, but when I asked him, I was like, what is the way? Like, what is the way? It just tells us how to live the way. Do yeah. you know that? Do you know what the way um, is? Well, <laughs> let's look at the first poem here to start to answer that question, right? The way that can be spoken of is not the constant way. The name that can be named is not the constant name. The nameless was the beginning of heaven and earth. The named was the mother of the myriad creatures. Hence, always rid yourself of desires in order to observe its secrets, but always allow yourself to have desires in order to observe its manifestations. These two are the same, but diverge in name as they issue forth. Being the same, they are called mysteries, mystery upon mystery, the gateway of the manifold secrets. Now, that doesn't really seem to answer your question, does it? Um, the basic point of this poem, at least as I see it, is that if you consciously try to follow the way, if you wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a Taoist, and I'm going to live my life the Taoist way, you have already fucked up, <laughs> right? You've already got it wrong. You can't make a conscious decision to follow the way because it relies on following your unconscious instincts and just allowing yourself to be in harmony with nature, right? So, I mean, really the, the two major principles here to keep in mind with Taoism are that one, everything is relative. Right. Meaning is always dependent on context. The same act or the same symbol won't always mean the same thing in different situations. So act according to your specific circumstances at the moment, right? You can't set hard and fast rules to apply to every possible situation because no two situations are actually alike. Secondly, you must learn to accept natural processes. Right? Death and aging are inevitable. Storms, floods, these disasters are inevitable, right? So you should not rail against nature for doing things that you have no control over, right? You should live according to nature. You should follow 
those old ruts with your chariot wheels, right? Now we see some um, reference to this way of thinking. Um, let's see, where is the passage? If we look on uh, the last page of the excerpt, page 1354. Can I get somebody to read, starting with a man is supple and weak? A man is supple and weak when living, but Thank hard you. and stiff when dead. Grass and trees are pliant and fragile when living, but dried and shriveled when dead. Thus the hard and strong are the comrades of death, the supple and the weak are the comrades of life. Therefore, a weapon that is strong will not vanquish, a tree that is strong will suffer the axe, the strong and big takes the lower position, the supple and weak takes the higher position. Great, thank you, Bradley. <clears throat> All right, so the basic point here, right, is that <clears throat> things that we think of as strong, right, things that are stiff, things that are powerful, right, things that are hard are actually weak because they're not able to bend when circumstances demand it, right? right? When the wind blows hard, which tree is going to survive? The stiff, hard tree or the soft, pliable one that can bend with the wind, right? Grass bends with the wind and doesn't survive. Right? bends and springs back up when you step on it, right? So the pliant, what appears to be passive or weak, is actually stronger, is actually mightier. Now, we can see where a philosophy like this would come out of a period of social instability, right? On the one hand, you have the legalists saying, we have to step in and make all kinds of rules and make the state strong again so that people stop running around doing whatever the hell they want. On the other hand, you have the Taoists saying the best way to survive in a dangerous and chaotic world is to bend, right? Is to lay low, conserve your energy, and wait for the storm to pass, right? Roll with it, don't fight it. Does this make sense to everybody so far? Is everybody getting, is all of this stuff starting to make a little bit more sense to you? Okay, great, so how many of you are familiar with this symbol? Okay, what is this called? Yin-yang. Yin-yang, right? The white side of this is yang, right? Yang is a masculine, active, and aggressive principle. The other side is yin, right? Yin is regarded as feminine and passive. Taoism stresses living life with a balance of forces, but really kind of tends to favor the yin side. Of the uh, of the equation here, right? It favors passivity. It favors um, femininity. Like even you know when we talk about sort of that language about the womb, right? Is you know is the you know the woman is potential you know vessel of life. Now, what else do we notice about each side of the yin yang here? What's inside it? What's inside each half? A piece of the opposite, yeah, exists within all things, right? And where it stops, the begins. Yes. 
and you come to know a thing through knowing its opposite, right? You can't know a thing directly. You can't know a thing unless you know what it's not. If we look at the second poem here on page 1346, can I get uh, somebody to read from The Whole World Recognizes the Beautiful? Yeah, Elliot, go for it. The whole world recognizes the beautiful as the beautiful, yet this is only the ugly. The whole world recognizes the good as the good, yet this is only the bad. The something and nothing produce each other. The difficult and the easy complement each other. The long and the short offset each other. The high and the low incline towards each other. Note and sound harmonize with each other. Before and after follow each other. Therefore the sage keeps to the deed that consists in taking no action and practices the teaching that uses no words. The myriad creatures rise from it, yet it claims no authority. It gives them life, yet claims no possession. It benefits them, yet it exacts no gratitude. It accomplishes its task, task, yet lays claim to no merit. It is because it lays claim to no merit that its merit never deserts it. So this poem is essentially divided into two halves, right? And the first half is primarily concerned with harmonizing opposites, right? And knowing a thing by knowing what it is not, right? Knowing the beautiful by knowing what the ugly is, right? Knowing the good by knowing the evil, knowing something by knowing nothing, right? We've already sort of looked at that as how, you know, you need nothing, right? You need to adapt nothing in order to have the use of something. The second half of this, though, I think, speaks more to what Taoism has to say about human behavior, right? What gives us merit? What gives us power, according to this poem? How do we get merit? Yeah, by not expecting that the things we do will bring us acclaim, will bring us merit, right? You act in accordance with nature because that feels right. You don't act out of a desire for someone to praise you or give you stuff, right? Yeah, Kathy. Is it kind of like not expecting anything? Like, because I heard that like if you expect something and you don't get it, then you're more hurt than if you just don't care about it. And then when you get it, then you're like, oh, that's good. Is it kind of like that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of this is largely about not really caring about worldly advancement or about um, worldly goods, right? Let's look at another uh, another poem that I think sort of is speaking on a similar. Uh, along similar lines. If we look at number 12 on page 1348, can I get um, somebody to read, starting with the five colors, make man's eyes blind? The five colors Thanks, sir. make man's eyes blind. The five notes make his ears deaf. The five tastes injure his palate. Riding and hunting make his mind go wild with excitement. Goods hard to come by serve to hinder his progress. Hence the sage is for the belly, not for the eye. Therefore he discards the one and takes the other. So what we have here is a kind of anti-sensualist message, right? Don't do things just because they please your senses, right? Don't purchase things because they please your senses. Don't do, st you know, don't do stuff uh, for shits and giggles like riding and hunting, right? Remain inactive, remain still, and things will come to you. Right? You gather energy through an action, right? Through emptying yourself of desire, you collect day. Right? You don't acquire day as a Taoist through quote unquote virtuous behavior, right? You acquire it through Wu Wei, right? We've got it over here, through non-action. 
by saving your strength, by conserving your energy. Uh, to give you another example of this, uh, let's see, what is the one that I'm looking for? If you look on page 1352, um, it's poem 38 here, right? A man of the highest virtue does not keep to virtue, and that is why he has virtue. A man of the lowest virtue never strays from virtue, and that is why he is without virtue. The former never acts, yet leaves nothing undone. The latter acts, but there are things left undone. A man of the highest benevolence acts, but from no ulterior motive. A man of the highest rectitude acts, but from ulterior motive. A man most conversant in the rights acts, but when no one responds, rolls up his sleeves and resorts to persuasion by force. Hence, when the way was lost, there was virtue. When virtue was lost, there was benevolence. When benevolence there was, was lost, there was rectitude. When rectitude was lost, there were the rights. The rights are the wearing thin of loyalty and good faith and the beginning of disorder. Foreknowledge is the flowery embellishment of the way and the beginning of folly. Hence, the man of large but mind abides in the thick, not in the thin, in the fruit, not in the flower. Therefore, he discards the one and takes the other. Okay, to make this a little bit more clear, right? What the poet is doing here is setting up a kind of hierarchy from the best and purest expression of all things to its palest and most inferior imitation, right? So I say the poet because there was probably no such person as Lao Tzu, right? Lao Tzu is a semi-mythical figure to whom the Tao Te Ching is attributed, but we have no idea who actually wrote this. So the hierarchy that the Tao Te Ching sets up, right, is the way as the best of all things, right? And the word Tao, sometimes spelled with a D, sometimes with a T in English, um, is simply a translation of the way, right? That's all that means. The next best thing is the practice of virtue. If you can't be virtuous, if you can't be righteous in all things, you can at least be benevolent. Right? You can at least do your best to be kind and giving to others, right? If you can't be benevolent, you can at least behave according to a social code, right? Rectitude. If you can't even bring yourself to behave according to a social code, then you have to cultivate yourself through rites and rituals, right? You have to be taught how to behave with other people. So when the way is present in the world, you don't need these other things, right? Each of these is a pale is a slightly paler imitation of the true way, right? If the way is present in the world, then you don't need to practice virtue, right? It just happens. If people are overly focused on rituals and rules, it means the world is fallen, right? It means that we are far from the way, and we need to, you know, we, people are trying to work their way back to it, right? So an over-dependence on ritual is, for the Taoist, the sign of a fallen world, right? So how then would a Taoist, do you think, respond to Confucianism's emphasis on ritual? Pardon? It wouldn't be the most efficient thing to do if you're really going for sure. well, For one thing, rit ritual is based entirely on action, right? You're moving around a lot, you're talking a lot, you're doing stuff, 
right? You're, you know, playing an instrument or dancing or, you know, waving an object around, right? So ritual is based on action. If you need to act, right? If you need to act, then you are not following the way. You're not conserving your energy. So yeah, it's inefficient. So why is the ceremony so focused on action? Well, because Taoist practice is descended large, it, like most of what you see happen in a Taoist temple has probably less to do with what's actually written in the Tao Te Ching and more to do with folk tradition. However, one thing that is genuinely Taoist about that ceremony, so it does seem to relate back to the Tao Te Ching, right, is that the priest is primarily focused on what he's doing, right? And not on what's going on around him. Right? Confucianism is very much about hierarchy, about doing the right thing at the right time, about how to behave in relation to others. Taoism is really much more about um, collecting potential energy within yourself through not acting when you don't have to. All right, does this make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about it? Like, are, there still, are there any of these poems you found particularly interesting or confusing that you'd like to talk about? That you'd like to ask questions about? thing that I want to focus on for a second here and then we'll let everybody go. Um, turn to page 1350, poem 19. Can I get somebody to read this starting with Exterminate the Sage? something to which they can't attach themselves. Exhibit the unadorned and embrace the uncalled block. Have little thought of self and as few desires as possible. Okay, so one of the reasons I wanted to look at this is because this image of the uncarved block um, is one of the central motifs in the Tao Te Ching. Right? So what does the uncarved block represent? So if you've got a block of wood in front of you, that has not yet been carved, what can it be? Yeah, Kathy? Exactly, you can make that uncarved block into anything because no one has yet tried to cut into it, right? The uncarved block is limitless potential. Now the other thing I wanted to note in this particular poem, right, when he talks about exterminating the sage, you know, exterminate the sage, discard the wise, the people will benefit a hundredfold. We see this sort of as part of a theme in the Tao Te Ching as well, um, where the speaker is constantly counseling the reader to get rid of the distinctions that cause people to fight amongst each other. Right? If you don't favor some people over others, 
right? If you don't give special privileges to some people because of their behavior, because of their wealth, or what have you, then there's nothing for people to fight over, and everyone gets along. Right? That it's desire for status, it's desire for wealth, it's desire for recognition that encourages people to fight, that encourages people to compete with each other. And, you know, while you know, contemporary American politics and economics are largely based on an ethics of competition. Remember historically where this is coming from, right? This is coming out of a state that has fallen apart, um, in which, you know, villages are being burned daily, right? And people are just trying to survive. And there are those who think, Maybe, maybe wouldn't it be nice if we just stopped, you know, spearing each other to death um, over some of these little distinctions, right? All right, so if nobody has any questions, I have um, some guide questions for uh, Augustine's Confessions, which is the first, the first thing we're going to be reading after the midterm exam, right? Um, that is another thing I need to remind everybody of, right? This is the last thing we're reading in Volume A, right? So for Augustine, after the midterm exam, switch to volume B for that. So we need to have that read by next Monday? By next Monday, yeah, exactly. Um, and also, one more thing. Um, I know that there are some people in here who are entitled um, to separate testing space. Uh, from disability services, if that applies to you, you set that up with them yourself. I don't set that up. So you will need to contact um, Evelyn Oliver at Disability Services if you are entitled to uh, separate testing space. All right. That's all I got for you.